here we go. Um, so cooperation helps us achieve a spatial diversity. And uh, it's, it's an alternative to multi-antenna devices, which may not be possible for particularly uh, devices with constricted form factors. So specifically, I'm going to talk about cooperation in a multi-axis network. And by that, I mean a network of many sources or users that are communicating with a destination. And uh, you can induce cooperation in uh, many ways. There are two basic ways. One is getting sources to overhear each other's transmissions and forward packets for one another. Alternately, and this was an idea uh, that was uh, developed by Sendinaris El Capenar Zhang in 98. And uh, alternately, one can um, introduce a, a, a dedicated relay node that listens to all the users and forwards packets for all the users. Uh, this thesis is really about a, 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 a multi-axis network where you have one relay, one destination, and many sources. So, does it matter how, I mean, does it matter if you do user cooperation or relay cooperation? And I, I think our thesis here is that the choice of cooperative approach matters. And we will show that over the process of the next hour. And, and, and just basically from a, a thousand foot view, you see that user cooperation implies you have to get these users to uh, agree to share their power and bandwidth, their valuable resources with one another. And on the other hand, if you are a network service provider who wants to put relays down, then you have an infrastructure cost. But it's not as simple as just those basic costs. You also have to take into consideration if cooperation actually has uh, other overheads. Like when you uh, forward packets for another user, isn't there a processing cost involved? And typically, this is not considered. So this thesis will actually take that into account in comparing these forms of cooperative schemes. And uh, the metrics we are going to use to compare user and relay cooperation in a multi-axis network is the sum rate and outage probability. So um, before we do that, we're going to develop a model for what I call a simple hierarchical network, which is just you, you're building a hierarchy in this network by introducing a relay as a layer between the sources and the destination. So let's look at that network first, and then we'll go into about comparisons. So the multi-axis relay channel is a network where you have multiple sources, one destination, and one relay. This was a model that was actually uh, introduced by Kramer and Van Van Garden about uh, seven years back. And, um, it is that, and, and, and as you can see just from the network, uh, that it is a multi-axis generalization of the uh, classic relay channel that was first introduced by Van der Mullen and later studied in much detail by Cover and Elgama. You can compare it with many things. For instance, you, in a cellular network, it would be like uh, uh, it, if the cellular provider decides to introduce a relay in a particular sector of uh, the cell. In fact, that is, the, that is how we will build up our, 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 our results. So you'll see that that is the motivation. And likewise, in an enterprise wireless network, you can, you, can, you can sectorize the entire area that the wireless access point serves and then break it up into sectors and introduce relays so you're servicing all the users in that area. The whole idea is to improve coverage, so sectorizing the area and introducing more relays can help. So we'll see that soon. So let's look at quickly an abstract model for this network. The idea is, say here we're considering looking at K users. Each user has its own message, independent of the other users to transmit. Each user is going to signal using its own signaling set, which we denote by XK for user K. And it uses the channel n times to transmit its message. So this is a block signaling model that will come up later. Um, the relay is actually listening to the signals from the users. And we denote the relay signal by YR. Again, the relay listens over an entire block of n. And, and the signaling of the relay is, 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 is taking into account the fact that the relay is actually a, a device that causally uh, produces a signal. In other words, whatever it transmitted at any point in time is only a function of whatever it heard until the previous instant of time. Uh, the destination, again, collects its signals. Uh, what it receives is a collection or an aggregation of signals from all the sources and the relay, which is also a transmitter. And uh, the destination's job is to then decode the messages from the users. Uh, the model I've sh I sh I shown you here is a full duplex relay model. 
In other words, the relay can transmit and receive at the same time in the same bandwidth. And one of the reasons for studying this model is that the more practical half-duplex models just fall out as special cases of this network. And uh, the idea is, the question immediately arises, is how can the relay help you? How can the relay process its signals? And, and there are many ways it can do it, and each one is what's called an achievable scheme or strategy. Um, so quickly looking at the half-duplex case, what is happening here is that the relay uh, takes its entire time or bandwidth or what you call channel dimensions, and it breaks it up into two fractions, one in which it spends its time first listening to the transmissions from the users, and the remaining fraction that it actually forwards that transmission in, in the appropriate form. Um, the, the interesting channel model for us is the wireless channel, where we are going to model this abstraction, this circle here, which is just a probability distribution right now. I mean, a conditional probability of the outputs given the inputs. This is going to be modeled as an editor white Gaussian noise channel with fading. And of course, in that case, your transmitters will also have a cost constraint, which is your power constraint, an average power constraint. Uh, so what is known about the mark? The mark was introduced by Kramer and Van Van Garden. And in that paper, they also developed a, a strategy called decode and forward. They first did it for the Gaussian case, and then it was generalized for the discrete memoryless case late, later by Kramer, Gaspar, and Gupta. And the idea there is that the relay listens listens to an entire block of signaling from the sources, and then decodes all the sources' messages, re-encodes these messages, and transmits them in the next block. And, uh, and, what, and the particular decoding scheme that they used at the destination was, was for the destination to wait until all such messages from the sources and with help from the relay had been sent, and then process, one could look at it as an offline processing technique. And, uh, and yet another result they had, which is a very uh, comforting result because there are so few capacity results in the multi-terminal arena information theoretically, was that they showed for a specific uh, channel model, the Gaussian channel model, where the channel fading is where during the transmission you see all possible channel fading states, which is the ergodic fading model, that if the sources and relay, they're clustered within a, a certain area, then decode and forward actually achieves capacity for this network. Okay, so let's go in. Let's look at what we are. Uh, what, what are the contributions of my thesis? Um, in addition to working on the decode forward, I actually also extended some of the basic um, achievable strategies that Core and Elgamal developed for the relay channel, and they can be sort of summarized by these uh, strategies. One is. Uh, compress and forward where the relay actually does not decode, but it actually compresses, and I'll give you the details as we go to that part of the work. And um, another approach is amplify and forward, and you can also have a special thing called partial decoding forward, and then consider some mixed strategies. Um, we also took uh, the, uh, the work by Kramer and uh, Gaspar and Gupta on backward decoding and, and asked the question if we can do a more real-time decoding at the destination for decode forward, and we developed uh, an encoding scheme that will help us do that. And then um, the, 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 the part of the talk, uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about most in this presentation was to compare user and relay cooperation in a multi-access channel. To do this, we actually uh, consider half-duplex models for both networks. And we, uh, they are two different networks. So to make a comparison that's seemingly fair, we actually developed a power-based cost metric. In other words, we account for the transmit power as well as the processing power that's involved in transmitting your own messages or less, cooperating for others. And then we make a comparison and ask the question, when does it make sense for users to share their power and bandwidth resources to cooperate with others, to forward for others, be it the user cooperative network or the relay cooperative network? And if there are any benefits to using one network over the other. And finally, there's another theoretical result that we developed and, um, that I worked on, and um, that was uh, obtaining the sum capacity for a degraded Gaussian mark. And I will briefly uh, give you the highlights of this work a little later. Um, so let's quickly dive into, uh, you know, uh, in out of bounds achievable strategy. And what I mean by that is, uh, what are the upper bounds on the capacity and, and what are the kinds of strategies you can uh, achieve by different methods of relaying? 
So the outer bounds are really obtained uh, by uh, the classic uh, Maxwell-Minkart theorem as applied to a network. Um, and they're called the cut set bounds, because what happens is when you model the network as a graph, then you use these cuts to cut a network into a set of transmitters to the left of a cut and the receivers to the right of a cut. So if you think about it, consider just this two user, one destination relay mark. And what you have is the relay is both a transmitter and a receiver. So if I take a cut, now I'm considering the, the total flow of rate or bits from these sources to the receivers in this network. So then the relay acts as another receiver along with the destination. And what you get as a cut here is, and, and, the, and the way I'm measuring the flow in this network information theoretically is by using the mutual information. So this cut tells me that I actually can get a SEMO bound, meaning I can, I can use the relay and the destination as two antennas. So this is the best I can do with this network. On the other hand, if I take another cut, where because the relay is also a transmitter, I can take another cut, and then you get uh, a bound where the relay is helping the transmitters as an additional antenna. So this is the best you can do on the other bound. So you will see that some of the achievable strategies that we talk about will can achieve one cut or the other, depending on the network geometry. So let's briefly review what is known about the code forward, and then you can understand, uh, and then quickly uh, go over our contribution of offset encoding. So now, decode and forward, as I mentioned before, is about the sources using the channel in, in large chunks, you know, over end users of the channel, they transmit their messages. And I'm considering here two sources, and they're transmitting the messages. I show a new message in every block in red. The, the relay listens until the whole block, until the end of the block, it and decodes the messages and re-encodes it and, and transmits it again the next block. Now, if the relay has decoded this message correctly, then both the source and the relay have access to the same message, so you can actually use that to, uh, to achieve a coherent combining gates at the destination. So the source, not only does it send a new message, it repeats its message from the previous block in every block. And because the users are independent, you actually, when you do a code construction, you would use these auxiliary random variables to create the code box. Now, what happens? So as I told you, the relay decodes at the end of each block. So what does the destination do? So one approach for the destination is to wait until all the messages have been sent by the sources and the relay and start to decode from the very last block. What I've shown you here is three blocks. So the relay waits, uh, so the destination waits until the very end. And this technique is called backward decoding. It was introduced by Willems uh, in 1982 uh, as a part of his thesis. And, um, and what it involves is that the destination waits until the very end, and it starts decoding these messages. And what you get as a result is it's a multi-axis decoding scheme at the relays. So you get a multi-axis rate region at the relay for some input distribution and some signaling scheme at the sources and the relay, in other words. And then at the destination, it's again a multi-axis uh, decoding scheme, except now even the relay is helping the users. So you see that in the mutual information expressions. So you get another multi-axis rate region. So the effective rate region is really an intersection of the two rate regions. So the question to ask is, can you do any better than having to wait until you receive all the messages and do this processing offline at the destination? So. After all, as you see, at the end of two blocks, you've received all of the messages from the previous block from both the sources and the relay. So why can't you just use a sliding window and decode as you go along? It turns out, yes, you can. But you just don't achieve the same rate region as backward decoding. In fact, you can, at best, for only some special cases, achieve the backward decoding rate region. You achieve, in general, a smaller rate region. So what we proposed to do was to fix that, was to offset our or transmissions of the sources. And how do we do that? Um, we first pick an offset order. And by offsetting, I mean that we delay the transmission of each source by a block at a time. So if I choose my offset order as 1, 2, that means my first source transmits in the first block, like before. But my second source doesn't start its transmissions until the second block. In other words, it's sending something dummy, a known signal, in the first block. And if I had one more source, it would start its transmissions in the third block. So at the relay, it doesn't matter. At, at the end of each block, it's receiving a message. It decodes the message. So the rate region of the relay doesn't change. At the destination, now the first messages from both sources actually takes three blocks. 
including what the relay has to decode and send. So now you use a sliding window of three. Yes. Oh, um, in this case, well, you could use a sliding window of three, but um, you would still you you still will not achieve the rate region of backward decoding unless the window's length is almost equal to the entire set of messages. It, it doesn't still improve, and, and that's because of the interference coming up from each block. Um, so asymptotically, you would improve. That's the only you, you don't improve unless you include the entire set of messages. Um, so coming back to using a sliding window of three with offsetting, it turns out what we can achieve at the destination are the corner points of the rate regions uh, of the previous rate region that we achieved with backward decoding. But each corner point is achieved for one offset order or permutation of the ordering of the sources when they transmit. So effectively, you, we can achieve the other points by time sharing, and then you can achieve the entire rate region at uh, the, the entire decode forward rate region by offsetting over, I mean, by considering all such permutations. OK, so let's go into another strategy uh, where the relay decides not to decode, but it decides to compress the signal that it received from the, destiny, from the, from the sources. And, and, and compression is really quantization. So you can take a block of signals and do vector quantization. But what the relay does is something even smarter. It figures out that not only is it receiving a message from the sources, but the destination also has a signal from the sources. It's a different signal, but it's correlated because it carries the same message from the sources. So the relay does what's called Weiner's of compression. In other words, it sends just as much quantized information as necessary for the destination to decode. Of course, the, 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 the compression rate also depends on how good the channel is from the relay to the destination, because the relay compresses its signal and then forwards it. In other words, in every block, the sources transmit their messages. The relay comes in, and it compresses whatever it received as a new signal. And it has a message to go with that. And, and, the, and, and, and then in the next block, again, this is due to causality, in the next block, the relay forwards that message to the destination via another uh, signaling scheme, right? So, or what we call code word in information theory. Uh, so the destination can decode this message depending on how good the channel is between the relay and the destination. So if the relay and the destination were really close and they had a very high SNR channel between them, I can actually do a very high compression scheme. Sure. Sorry, I, I, I have a question here about where is Weiner's of compression happening? So the Weiner's of compression is happening at the relay. So effectively what Weiner's of means is that uh, the relay c creates a large uh, set of code books, but it actually, or a large set of messages, but it sends fewer of them. Oh, okay. It is, it's not being expressed here because I need to put a constraint in there to show that it is happening. I mean, you know, formally it's included, but, you know, you might want to do it more explicitly by making it that it's ER1 of X hash. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So I could sh also show that these are from two different sets. One being Yeah, so I guess I should I could sh I should show it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It is it is it is formally included, but yes, I I could also set it in the fashion that um, whatever I compress at, at this end is also again bounded by how smartly the destination decodes this at the other end. And so that, that also takes into account the one as if compression. Okay. Um, so, so one point I do want to make is that just as uh, Kramer et al. showed that decode forward achieves capacity when these when the sources and the relay are clustered, sort of giving you the transmit antenna diversity. You know, one of the bounds and the cut set bound, the the meso bound, the the compressed forward actually when the relay is very close to the destination, you it's literally like handing off its signal because you have such a high rate channel bandwidth channel between you and the destination between the relay and the destination. So you can achieve the other cut set bound, 
which is the CMO cuts it. Right. Um, so quickly, there are two more strategies. One is the um, one is a partial decode and forward, and, and, and I think it is now being also called multi-path decode and forward. Um, and the idea there is that uh, instead of letting the relay decode the entire message from the source, um, the relay only decodes the message partially. In other words, you can model that as saying the source relay sends two streams in every block, but the relay only decodes one stream. This strategy is particularly useful for the half duplex case. What, what I mean by that is that in this strategy, uh, the relay would decode the message in its listening fraction completely from the sources. But then when, when the relay is transmitting, it cannot listen, but the sources have an ability to directly send a message to the destination. So in other words, the sources are really sending two messages, but only one of them is being decoded by the relay. And you will see that in detail when I talk about strategies and compare it with user cooperation. So message streams are related to the directions? So in the half duplex case, the two message streams are related to the fractions. In other words, uh, a message stream happens, there is one message stream in one fraction and another message stream in the second fraction. Otherwise, you, you imply some sort of layer. Uh, right. So in the most general scheme, if the relay could transmit and listen at the same time, uh, you would be sending both, fraction, both streams together. So the relay is sort of decoding in the presence of inf interference. But uh, my claim is that this strategy is particularly useful for the half duplex case, and you'll see that in a short while. Um, Roy? OK. Uh, you frowned, so I want to make sure. OK. All right. Amplify. And, and the other strategy, which is particularly, again, useful for Gaussian channels, is, uh, is is, is, is a scheme where the relay does not decode, it does not compress, it merely takes its received signal and it uh, scales it, subject to its power constraint, and forwards that to the receiver, uh, to the destination. And clearly, obviously, what it's doing is a noisy uh, forwarding of its, whatever it received noisily from the sources. Now, in the full duplex case, it turns out that this just can be modeled as a a unit memory in, into symbol interference channel, and you can actually apply the uh, the capacity region developed by Cheng and Verdu to obtain the rate region. Uh, it's more interesting in the half duplex case again, and because what happens now is when you use the the the, the, the ch when you break up the channel bandwidth for transmit and receive, you actually have to now consider it as a ve vector channel, and you will see the results very soon. I'll go into the details soon. Um, the, the, the fundamental limitation of amplifying forward is that um, you're amplifying noise. And so that limits uh, the kind of rates you can achieve. And particularly in the very low SNR regime, you, unless you do something, uh, unless you do use some specific strategies, you also limit your diversity gains. Um, so having just had an overview of everything, of, of the strategies that you can use for a multi-access relay channel, let's go in and ask the question, um, are there any benefits to using uh, user cooperate, uh, getting users to cooperate in a multi-access network, or is it better to uh, use a relay, or is it better to not cooperate at all? So you say a low SNR, low SNR in the relay, or low SNR in the destination? Uh, actually, it, 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 well, that matters, but I think when, they, when I'm talking about low SNR here, it's a, a general wide band, very low SNR channels. Low SNR. Yeah. So, right, yes. So, in fact, what you have to do is uh, use a very high bursty uh, signaling. So, over a very short period of time, you're going to use all your power to transmit. And that gives you the diversity that you get in the highest scenario with AF, which means you can get a two path diversity with Amplify Forward, but you have to use a bursty scheme. I'm sorry? Do you still have interference from, I mean, you still have noise amplification. Is that what you're talking about? Or in, um, in the multi-axis uh, case? Yes. Yes, of course. Oh, so are you asking if the users will get time duplexed in that sense? OK. Um, I would guess. I mean, I have actually not looked at bursty amplifying forward, but I would guess. OK. Right. 
what, if they if if you had smart back off schemes, then they shouldn't. Right. So it's almost like saying, oh, you would do UWV at each of them, but you would just make sure you don't interfere with each other, because then you're completely jammed in that high power um, case. Yeah. OK. Um, so let's look at uh, the network models for user cooperation and relay cooperation. Um, so the basic network model is many sources, one destination. Right? And so in the user, so it's k sources, as we call them, and the destination node is denoted by d. In the user cooperation case, the uh, users are going to listen to each other. In the relay case, you're going to introduce a relay. And the users are not listening to each other. They use all their power and bandwidth for, the, for their own transmissions. What we are going to do is compare the two networks based on the rates they can achieve for a particular channel model. and this this metric that we call energy efficiency it's a bits per joule metric the, the the rate you can achieve for the amount of energy you expend or power you expend and and an outage for an appropriate channel model and what we are going to do in, in making these comparisons is account for the processing power that you require to do cooperation in each network now uh, before we go into the details I want to sort of give you an overview of um, why and how we do this and uh, the, the idea of this, the, these are two different, uh, quickly going back to that figure, these are two different networks. There's one extra node in the relay network. There are the total, the total, the power constraints of the sources are the same in both networks, but you have additional power in the relay. How do you make a comparison of these two networks? So what we do is we use uh, a total power as the cost metric. But this total power is not just the transmit power of the users and the relay, but it is also the power that these users use and the relay uses to, uh, to do any kind of processing of its signals, encoding, decoding. And, uh, and so we, in fact, introduce uh, specific scale factors to, to uh, scale our processing power for encoding operation and decoding operation. And the processing power itself is a function of the transmission rate. And you will see the specific model so. So I'm just giving you a highlight here. As I said before, you're going to compare the sum rate of this network, the total throughput of this network, as well as the outage probability, which gives you a sense of the diversity you can achieve via cooperation. And you're going to compare it as a function of the total power. And uh, also the energy efficiency metric. And, and the idea is to present regimes, power regimes, where um, one or the other model of cooperation is desirable. So before we actually, uh, you know, dive into the models, I'm going to ask, uh, so I'm going to provide you some motivation. So consider some very simple uh, uh, mobile devices. So uh, let's take our cellular phones. And we know that it had, you know, as they are advertised, they have reasonably long standby times, but uh, they have uh, short talk times, about four hours. And in fact, you can do the computation, and I haven't done all this. This is thanks to Naren and Roy who wrote this in the proposal. And he read the voltage in. Oh, it actually has even that number. The amperage and voltage. OK, yeah. Right. So it's about 10 kilojoules of battery power that you have that you can use either for your own transmissions or for somebody else's transmissions over a total time of four hours. And it's a low bit rate device, about 10 kilobits per second. And, and what you get, lo and behold, is about half a kilojoule per megabyte of usage. That means nothing until you start looking at some other device, say like uh, a wireless LAN card. And apparently, uh, Atheros has a white paper where it describes the amount of power that they use for processing and the amount of power. And we all know what you know, the, the, the spectral mask is for wireless LAN. It's about 20 to 100 milliwatts, right? Power commute for transmit power. And you can clearly see there's a huge difference in this in these two uh, values for communication versus processing. So, and we're talking about you know, bandwidths or transmission rates of 1 to 20 megabits per second. Let's assume 3 megabits per second. Assume an average of 3 watts for transmission and processing. What you get here is a, a joule per megabyte. Right, right. Now, now, 
the question is immediately people will go, oh, that's a low data rate operation. This is a high data rate operation, so you're energy efficient. But the real question to ask is, why is a cell phone a low data rate operation and a and, and wireless LAN a high data rate operation? In fact, it depends on, uh, on the regimes that they operate. But before we go there, let's look at one other case of wireless device. This is uh, typically a low rate, low power device. That is what sensor devices have been um, modeled to be. And um, the, the folks at MIT actually came up with an uh, energy model transmission and processing model for the Berkeley modes. Um, and what they did is they, they broke up the transmit, total transmission energy into two parts. One, which is just circuitry and processing, and the other, which actually depends on the total transmit cost as a function of distance. And this was really done for a uh, path loss exponent of two. And they said that the received costs were actually very similar to the transmit cost. What is the um, I actually don't know. I'm sorry. Thank you. I tried looking. I couldn't find it yesterday. Um, you know, I think I have emailed together. What is PA? Maybe I should. This is actually, yeah, that's to, what they give, to give true credit, this equation is from Hitesh's thesis. OK. Hitesh's thesis. This is his notation. OK. Nice student number nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The last thing on this. Right. Right. <laughs> well, the point, OK. So. so that's power amplification. The point is, in all these devices, really what is happening is it is distance that is determining where you expend your power. In fact, um, as was uh, uh, sort of written in the monograph and as well as in the proposal of Roy and Narayan, it is that uh, we can distinguish wireless links basically by two kinds of regimes where your energy costs are expended. One is in the long distance links typically a kilometer, where your transmit power is going to dominate because of the distance over which and the path loss exponents dominating your requirements. And the other is much shorter link communications, where the signal processing dominates. And in fact, power consumption in this case actually depends on your total aggregate incoming and outgoing rate, because you have to process all those bits. And, and, and in fact, and, and so immediately you can say that you can thre threshold these two regimes by a, some kind of crossover distance. Now, in the multi-terminal model that we are considering, uh, developing one crossover distance uh, did not seem like uh, an easy uh, solution. So what we did, or what I did in this, uh, in this work, was actually to scale, my, scale the power consumption, which depends on the rate in coming and outgoing, to scale it by a particular processing factor. And the processing factor is in turn going to determine whether I'm in the, uh, the transmit power dominated regime or in the, in, the, uh, in the single processing dominated regime. So let's look at the equation and you'll understand it better. So here's my cost metric for the two networks. I'm going to compare the two networks by the total power in each network. And the total power for the, uh, the multi-axis channel with no cooperation or the cooperative case is simply the total power consumed by each transmitter in that network, which is just the K sources. For the relay model, you also have to include the power at the relay. Okay? And how do I write out the total power at each node? I write the total power at each node as the sum of the power, the transmit power, and the power it takes to process its own signal, and the power that it takes to process anybody else's signal that it agrees to process. Likewise for the relay. So, so I still haven't told you what my processing uh, it's, an, it's an indicator function. So IK of J says that node K will process for node J. Uh, or this is the cost of processing for node J if this is 1, if node K processes for node so J. It's 1 if you agree to cooperate with somebody. Or yeah, it's one if you agree to forward for somebody, and the method of cooperation will determine how much power you use to do that. Um, it's one. It's an indicator function. It's one as if. Capital K. P K is the transmit power for you. That's correct. So in both networks, the transmit power for every user is P K. It's the same. Okay. In, in the relay network, there's an additional transmit power at the relay, PR. Okay. Um, 
So how do I uh, specifically write out the processing costs? At every node, there is a baseline processing cost. You could call it just from dissipation, electronics, circuitry, and so on. And that I just denote as uh, PK0 processing. On top of that, there is a cost at each node for uh, processing incoming and outgoing data. Uh, suppose node P was, uh, node K was worried about only doing its own processing. The rate at which it transmits will determine how much it processes. So when you're transmitting, you only do encoding. You don't do any decoding. So in fact, I write out specifically what the costs are for encoding and decoding. Now, fundamentally, my cost function for processing is basically just some function of the rate, rj. If user k helps user j, user k is going to incur a cost that's a function of the rate at which user j transmits to user k, that's rj. OK? And suppose uh, I help user j, user k helps user j by a decode and forward process. Then in that case, it has to decode the signal from user j, and then again encode it and, and transmit it. So I uh, distinguish the two costs by using two scale factors. Okay. So yeah, so the f is a function that can depend on a lot of things. I mean, it depends on the rate. You can have any kind of utility model for f. Specifically, the function we use is a log function. It's just log of 1 plus pj. Uh, good question. So in general, yes, they well, OK. So it is a highly. Um, what about, uh, it, it's a problem where parameters do depend very much on each other. But to, to come up with a very simple model, what we did was we said, maybe uh, the, 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 the nodes of the network are such that the cost they have, the, the, the scale factors they have for decoding and encoding are very small, or they could be very large. So we actually vary the range of these ethers and deltas. You're right. I mean, it is. It is. It is a very. Uh, it's a problem where all these parameters are related to each other. I think. I think the key word here is a model. Yeah. And it's a simple model that allows you to sort of parameterize something. And sure, I mean, I think you, know, you can argue sort of how this relates. But I think the important thing is sort of the regimes that we look at, when one dominates the other. Right. But it's a model. So to, to make, a, make it clear, the function that we will be using is a very simple function. It's just log of 1 plus uh, pj, the transmit power. It is SNR. Um, in all these models, the assumption is that um, it's editor white gas. So the noise is of unit variance, and then all the signals are being scaled by, um, I will come to the channel model very quickly, but um, it's being scaled by channel gains. Yes, in this, in the model we're considering, it's well. See, arch. Yeah. So. So it's it's not so simple, right? So if somebody else was helping you, the rate you actually get depends on you have to write out the achievable strategies for a set of rate for a set of powers that you have. So it is not a simple log function. Right. So in the most general model, this is strategy dependent. And so they are all very intertwined. So if you had to solve this optimization problem, it's you would write out the rate equations, you would write out the cost, and then you would have to go back and optimize the rates. So you may not necessarily operate at the maximum power. Right? Right. But, but that, that, that correct, but even even then, you may not even want to operate at the boundary of the rate region because now there's a cost associated with using that power, and so to step away from that rather complex problem and consider a much simpler case, we decided we'll just uh, put the function of the rate as just a log function, a very simple log function. It sort of models rate in in your classic Gaussian channel. It's like assuming that these sources were transmitting in a Gaussian. Uh, added to white Gaussian channel just to the destination, and they had an SNR of PJ at the destination. 
So that's the basic rate. Because even from cooperation, you're not going to get multiplexing gains. You're sort of getting gains within the log. So to first order, it's a reasonable approximation. So that was the uh, motivation. Um, so let's look at the two network models in detail. I mean, we have to ask the question, how are these users uh, transmitting? Uh, how are they helping each other and so on? So let's focus on that. What we have done here is we've modeled the channels as, uh, so the relay is a half duplex relay. And uh, the underlying channel is actually a fading editor white Gaussian noise channel. Uh, so when I mean half duplex relay, I mean the relay is going to allocate its, its, its bandwidth to listening to some for some fraction and transmitting for the remaining fraction. Specifically, the way the users are going to be scheduled is a time duplex scheme. So every user get its, gets a slot for transmission. This is how TDMA works. But now with cooperation, each slot of the user is broken down into two more two slots. They're not necessarily equal length slots. The slots depend on um, the amount of time that the relay listens. And, and then the remaining part, the amount of time that the relay, uh, the remaining time that the relay uh, transmits. We're looking at it all in time. You can do the same in bandwidth and frequency. Uh, so in fact, if you wrote out the rate regions, you would optimize over these uh, fractions to achieve the largest rates. OK? Um, the, the sources in each of their slots, they transmit over both of these fractions. OK? Um, for the user cooperative network, you can actually have two schemes. Because in the user cooperative network, there is not just one relay or one other user. There are up to, in a k user network, there are up to k minus one users that may be willing to help you. So you could either schedule all those. So in fact, I write it more generally as saying user k has lk minus 1. lk can be anywhere from 1, from 0 really, to uh, to all k, k minus 1 users. lk minus 1 can be that many. Um, so because you can have that many users, I can actually schedule the users in a couple of different ways. One is a simple two-hop scheme. So what I've again shown you here is for user 2. And I say that user 3 and 4 are willing to help user 2. So in the first fraction, user 3 and 4, as well as the destination, which always listens, are listening to user 2's transmission. In the second fraction, user 3 and 4 have now listened to the transmissions, and they're ready to forward this information. So all of them transmit, and the destination listens. This is a two-hop scheme. So in the two-hop scheme, in the user cooperative network, all the users that are willing to cooperate for you transmit in the second hop. Okay? You could alternately also consider a scheme where the users come on one at a time in a sequential order. So if again user two was being helped by three and four, three decides to go first because maybe it has a good enough channel, it listens to this and it can decode or it can do whatever processing it does quickly enough and then it starts transmitting. Four still waits and then it starts transmitting in the next fraction. So now I have many fractions. So if I had to find the rates, I would actually have to optimize over all these fractions. OK? All right. So let's look at the channel models. So we, as I mentioned many times, we're going to consider an additive white Gaussian noise channel. It's an additive channel. All the signals add. The signals are going to be scaled by a multiplicative channel gains, which I denote by HMK between the mth receiver and the kth transmitter. The model. For the, the fading gains, I'm going to consider two kinds of models. But in both models, there is a distance-dependent uh, part uh, that depends on the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, and there's, which is, of course, scaled by the path loss exponent. And, and there's a random part. For, in one case, we're going to assume the random part is not random. It's just one. And it was sort of an argument for that is to say uh, the nodes are all line of sight, so there's really, they're not suffering from fading. And the other model that we're going to consider is where uh, the, the random part is actually modeled as a complex, uh, proper complex Gaussian um, signal with a zero mean and unit variance. And, uh, and what I do want to mention is that these channel gains are assumed to be known only at the receiver. So in this quasi-static kind of model where the transmitters don't know the channel, it's a random channel that's sort of picked at the beginning of transmission and fixed. The users can't really uh, do any kind of beam forming to achieve coherent gains. 
so what, what they're going to rely on in, in that kind of model is the multi paths that go to the destination to get uh, uh, diversity gains. And so the specific metric that we will use for each model is for the no fading case, we're going to use sum rate, achievable sum rate. And for the quasi static case, we're going to use outage as the metric, outage probability as the metric. Okay, so let's look at the, the, the strategies that we are going to consider. We're going to consider two kinds of relaying or cooperative strategies. Um, for the no fading case, the two strategies are actually partial decode and forward and amplify and forward, and I'll give you the details in the next slides. For the quasi-static case, actually, uh, because we're interested in the maximum diversity of paths, there is no need to send any partial information that's only decoded the destination. You want everything to be decoded by the helper you, uh, nodes, the cooperating users. So we, you consider a decode and forward scheme, and specifically, we're going to consider a dynamic decode and forward scheme. And what that means is that these cooperating users in the user cooperative network or the relay in the relay cooperative network, they listen until they have successfully decoded. Right. It is in the high multiplexing gains regime. Because for one thing, DF achieves the MIMO bounds in the low multiplexing gain regime. Right. So would that help your group people? Yes. But I'm, I'm, so so the, the point I made was I'm interested in the maximum diversity, okay. which means it's the low multiplexing gains regime. Right. Um, I'm also looking at the high multiplexing gains has the, the, uh, the corresponding cost of high SNR. I mean, you would have to transmit at high enough SNR to be able to transmit at a higher rate. Your rate is scaling with SNR. So I sort of step away from the high SNR regime here. Okay. Um, so what are the processing power assumptions for each, um, uh, each case or each relink scheme? Clearly, in partial decode and forward or decode and forward, there is a cost for each helper node or cooperating node or relay to decode those signals and then re-encode them and forward. So your eta k and delta k are going to come into play. Uh, and it's, the function we already told you is going to be just a log of the power, and then these are going to multiply and determine how much power you consume in processing. In the amplify and forward model, we are going to consider a simple model where we assume that there are no cost processing costs for amplification. This may not necessarily be true in practice, but we're just going to assume that. Um, sort of giving amplify and forward a little bit of a leg up of favor here to see how well it can do. Um, so just as a reminder, in the amplify and forward scheme, the total power will be the same for the if you did no cooperation in the MAC and if you cooperated between the users, simply because all the power that is no, there's no cost to doing any relaying. There's only a cost to doing your own process. In the relay network, there's going to be an additional power of transmit power of the relay. OK? And you will see that that, that will make a very interesting uh, difference. Uh, so let's quickly go over the strategies. What do I mean by partial decode and forward? And so I have to consider both the two-hop and the multi-hop case. Now, as I mentioned before, when, when the channels are used, the user, the aim of the users is to send a message. So they send a message. In, in, a, in the first fraction, in which the cooperating users in the user cooperating network or the relay in the relay network listens. And after, after they are done listening and when they're ready to transmit, in the two hop model, all the users in the user cooperating network that are willing to transmit for you will jointly transmit the message. In addition to that, the source also decides, well, I'm getting all these beamforming gains from all these users transmitting. Let me also transmit an additional new message. And of course, I'm going to, it's an optimization problem. I'm going to optimize over all the power allocations. So it's a general enough model that it encompasses the special case of decode forward. Right? In the relay network, likewise, the relay will, uh, when it's ready to transmit, it will forward the message for you. And the source also sends another message. OK? Um, effectively, we're looking at this for the no fading channel. And what you get is rate increases are due to the coherent combining gates. OK? So the difference between these two? Between these two? OK, so the, the difference is just in the number of users that help you. 
that's why you have a stacked box here uh, depending on as many users. You could use the same signaling. It's all the same. It's just this is a sort of a general two hop. And this is a two hop for just one cooperating user. Yes, Larry? Are you saying that when you have multiple users cooperating with their signals are all arriving in phase? Yes. This entire model assumes that they're all synchronized at the time symbol level. Um, <laughs> uh, it is hard in practice to do that. Yes, very much. But I, OK, so let me make a comment. That's a good question. So the, the fact is I'm considering a no fading case here, and I'm talking about um, rate increase due to coherent combining gates. Even if you consider an ergodic channel where these, these guys don't know the channel state information, as long as you are sort of synchronized at a packet level, somebody else is forwarding for you. You have spatial diversity. Somebody else, so even though you may not have coherent beam forming diversity, again, you still get power gains from somebody else forwarding for you. And, and, and that's good. That's good. Just keep in mind that when they, we, they use, so cooperating users are doing this for each other, they're taking away power from their own transmit slot to do this for you. The relay is just sitting there to help you. So this will come into play when you see the plots. OK? Well, in, so in, in the, the half duplex case, the decode and forward is defined as the, the relay or the cooperating users decode everything. So you do not send a new message in the next fraction. So if I optimize this, and it turns out all these cooperating users are sitting closer to the destination than I am, then I may not actually waste my energy sending a direct message, because I can get so much gains from just having them forward it. For me. Well, in, uh, in MATLAB, it means you go over the, uh, the many loops into it. <laughs> it is also an optimization. You have to optimize over all of them. Um, uh, OK, so let's look at the multi-hop case, which is only for the user cooperative network. right? What happens here is that every user is going to come on as and when as they are ready to transmit. So if there are LK minus 1 users helping user K, then you have a total of LK slots, which includes the first slot where only user K transmits, and then the next guy comes on, and the third guy comes on, and so on up to the very end. So what user K does here is until every cooperating user has decoded, it, it transmits the same message, the same first message again and again. Once they're all done decoding and they're ready to transmit in the last slot, it, it says, why don't I also transfer another message directly? Of course, I'm going to optimize again over all the fractions and over all the power allocations. And this might just simplify the decode forward for some cases. OK? You'll see that. Yeah, you, so, but, so you're spreading your power over more hops. And you'll see the cost of that is pretty severe. Um, Look at amplifying forward. So an amplifying forward, these are equal length slots. So because these are half duplex, you're going to have a pre-log factor. In the, in the two hop case, you have a pre-log factor of half. And uh, the user transmits, as always, in both fractions. The cooperating users in the user cooperating network listen in the first fraction. They amplify that signal, and they forward it in the next fraction. OK? And the relay does the same. So uh, pretty straightforward. In the multi-hop case, which is only for the user cooperative network, I consider a rather simple model because this an analysis of this is pretty intense. Um, so what I consider is a model where uh, all the users listen in the first fraction, and then they come on one after the other and they transmit. So only one user at a time transmits in each slot. Yeah. So what are you doing at the cooperative scheme to do the coherent combining? Are you splitting the transmission into a are you, are you doing a superposition of the same? So in, 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 the, in the no fading case, you will do superposition plus a new message. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. You optimize over the, that power fraction. Uh, the, yeah, the power split between the new message and the old message. Because it probably wouldn't be hard to test how much um, beam forming you gain as compared to the spatial gains by just turning that off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you'll see how much additional. Small, I think. Or maybe large. Oh, I see. So, okay. Right. Yeah. 
No, so the, so it's a very very simple problem actually. Once you write the code for the larger optimization, it's a very simple problem. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it will help, but it may not help as much as the spatial. See, which one helps more is the issue. See, and, and if, if the informing scheme can only enlarge from the spatial, then you don't have to synchronize. It's not great. You have to synchronize at the receiver, but not at the transmitters, and that's great because uh, they can compare this stuff. So it's sort of the relative gains are very interesting. And they'll depend on the SNR, I'm sure. So, so, so I think this question can be answered if you look at the plots and you'll sort of see, yeah. once you see for the best case, the reason I only consider the uh, coherent combined case is sort of the best case. And everything is going to be scaled down from that when you consider, uh, when you do independent signaling. Sure. So, let me ask you, here you formulated a problem where the coherent combined case is uh, for processing and for transmission. Yeah. When you do your power allocation optimization, you uh, optimize over processing and transmission. No, I don't. Right? No, I don't. I don't. I told you it's a very, very complex problem, and I chose not to do that. Is just there to. Like this really simple sort of like suppose I was a service pro. Delay or sort of no, I mean, suppose I was, I was actually a network uh, deployer. I mean, I may not want to do such a complex optimization. I want to find out. Suppose these users are using a mask, 100 milliwatts, and they transmit it at 100 milliwatts, like the wireless LAN cards do. What is, if I had a cost that was proportional to that 100 milliwatts transmit power for encoding and decoding, and it will be because your rate is proportional to your transmit power. Then how how can I compare the rate I get to the power I uh, use? And that is all. That is the basic analysis here. So I didn't do a much larger optimization problem. I I looked at what I can do with with what we are doing already. In other sense, if this is what I transmit and this is the power I consume, how do they correlate with each other in terms of cost? That was the idea. Um, so okay. So all right. So now that we have looked at all the strategies, let's go into the plots. Uh, or the illustration of these results. So the geometry I'm going to consider is actually a sector of a circle. Um, I place the, the destination at the center of the circle. And I assume there's a dead zone of radius 0.3, just so it lets the users get a chance to cooperate. And, and I place the relay at 0.5. I can, I'll make a comment about that later. Uh, and I'm considering first, this is actually a placement of two users. But I'm going to consider 100, 100 random such uh, placements, you know, formally placing. And all my results are averaged over the sum rate I can get for the two users over all those 100 random locations. Okay? So in some sense, you're actually averaging over all possible path loss models. And uh, so I actually want to thank Larry for suggesting this. Um, Over the area of the sector. Yeah. Yeah. So they're more likely to be. Uh, yes. 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 Um, you got a question there? OK. Uh, so I'm also going to consider the users to be sort of homogeneous. They have the same transmit power P1, or uh, transmit SNR, meaning the noise is unit variance. So they have the same transmit SNR P1. I'm going to vary P1. Uh, I'm going to consider two kinds. Of, you know, I'm going to vary the number of users as either two or three, because in the three, you can see the multi-hop effects. Um, and I'm also going to set my scale factors, eta k and delta k, to be the same. Let's call it eta. I'm going to vary them from 0 0.1, 0 0.5, and 1. And what does that mean? That means that my processing power, which is really a log of my transmit power, really, right? I'm going to multiply the log of transmit 1 plus transmit power by a processing factor, which is either very, very small, or which is somewhere halfway in between, or one. So actually, I should have put a slide with my total power. So the total power is going to be my transmit power plus this processing cost. This processing cost will be very small when I'm, I'm, I'm talking about 1%. Yeah, I know. And I should have reintroduced that slide here, but we have to go back a little bit. OK, here. It's not so far away. Yeah. So first here is um, two users. Total power is going to be P1 plus P2. P1 total, P2 total. P1 total is the transmit power at P1 plus the processing power at P1. Forget that it's cooperating with somebody. But the processing power is now given by some baseline processing. I'm going to consider this to be 0. 
a function of the you know function of the transmit power here log of 1 plus p1 if it's for itself and then i'm going to multiply the processing by 0.01 two times 0.01 uh, depending on what it does I'm assuming equal power for encoding. Well, it's, it, it's not necessarily fair, but I didn't want to assume encoding is less expensive than decoding because this is not really true in some something. Like turbo is actually more expensive encoding than decoding. But uh, typical classical trellis coding is the opposite. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's all the front end costs and. Well, so so here's. The, that's not quite true. That's not true. That's not true. That's not true. If I'm only processing my own information, I'm not decoding anything. I have only an encoding cost. If I'm processing your information by decoding, and then I have both. No, I only set these two parameters to be the same, but my indicator functions are not the same. No, no, no. So suppose I was relaying for you, and I agreed to do, I agreed to decode your message. Then I have both decoding, encoding, and decoding costs. Yeah, yeah. Because I re-encode. Costs are always accounted for it's somebody who's a transmitter, and decoding is always somebody who's receiving a relay person. So, uh, so I, I do want to make one comment that I didn't make before. In all these things, I've assumed that destination is this high-powered. Uh, it has all the ability to do all the processing. I just don't take that into account here. It's going to scale everything by just one factor, so I don't do it. Um, but, uh, but I do want to come back to the point. So the relay, yes, the relay has its own transmit power, and whichever user it helps, it has a processing power associated with that user. But in, so there's only two, two models I'm considering, decode forward and amplify forward. In decode forward, you have an encoding and a decoding cost. In amplify forward, you actually, I'm sort of simplifying it and saying nothing. There's only a transmit cost. I mean, there is a cost in reality to amplifying, and there's an electronics cost, but it's, it's just another simple model, just, just to see what happens. And uh, likewise here. So the users get a cost based on the rate. It, should I clarify any more? Is this clear now? I also have, I also have a question. You could set it to set the cost and process power. Yeah, so yeah, I set it to zero, yeah. <laughs> it's a translation. I mean, you can scale everything by whatever. And if I pick any number, somebody will say, why well, 10 to the I minus 5?
helium, so you wouldn't have that benefit for the decoding forward of the clock circuit. And when I don't do anything, that can be correct the mechanism. And I can just set those to correct. Yeah, that is a, it's a very simple so, model. Anyway, maybe I make a comment after it shows the results. They sort of based on what you just said. Right. So therefore, you can view all these things as all these things as sort of best case results. Right. right. And I wanted to sort of see these best case results and then. No, but the point is those are all translations, and I think when you're making a comparison, you can still see uh, advantages or disadvantages of the, of the schemes. So let's go into uh, the plots. I'm gonna, the first set of plots we're going to look at are for partial decoding forward, forward, the no fading case. First, I'm going to look at the two user case. I'm going to plot the sum rate, the two users, as a function of just the transmit power P1 and as a function of the total power. And, and I will do that, the total power for the different values of the processing scale factor. As the processing scale factor increases, the total power consumed is, of course, going to correspondingly go up. Okay, so you'll see all the curves translated, and you'll see all that. Um, the, the way I choose the power for the relay is it's, it's a factor of the power for the transmitters. It's either half of it or it's the same. Okay? Uh, and I'll also plot the energy efficiency, which is just the ratio of the total rate achieved to the total power consumed in bits per joule. So let's look at it. Here is the partial decoding forward results for two hop. And the black curves with the star are always just the simple time duplexed multi-axis sum rate. Okay? And that's as a function of just the transfer power at each one of the sources. When I cooperate between the two users, I actually get about a little under 2 dB performance improvement, maybe 1 dB, um, over the entire range of my transmit power. Okay? With relay, I get even more. But in some ways, this, this curve, this, this, this plot does not account for the relay's power. So let's just really skip to the next plot. Okay? Uh, what I have here is the total power in the system. Total power used to transmit, used to process over all the nodes. And of course, the total power is going to be different for the relay network than the user cooperative network. Okay? So now what you see is that as the power of the relay increases, you don't get much from the relay. That little 1 dB gain actually just went away because that curve was shifted over because of, the inc more, because of using more transmit power. Right? But relay is still doing better for eta equals 0.01 relative to user cooperation. And it's sort of easy to understand this because the users are actually giving up their own power and transmission in the time relative to time duplexing to help each other. Right? If I increase my uh, uh, processing factor to, uh, to a half and then to one, you see that the performance of all these cooperative schemes becomes negligible relative to uh, time duplexing. The relay still has a little bit of an advantage. These are Gaussian channels. So we're, you know, as Gerhard pointed out, gains about 3 dB are good. So you know, here you see about 1 dB gain in a certain range, which is a low power range. And uh, that's where you want to operate. And if you use a relay, you still do better. So you take away that uh, coherent dividing advantage. It'll be worse. It will be worse. Would you say that there is going to be still any point to doing this in a Gaussian channel? It, for the relay, yes. Because the relay is sitting there with power. I mean, you're accounting for it, but it's still giving you a gains. I have a question. But it's smaller. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So is it fair to say, or at least is it reasonable to sort of think of eta equals to 0.01 as something that is reflective of a cellular regime? Right. Well, yeah. And eta equals to one as being something that reflects sort of what is happening with these modes. That essentially the crossover distance is sort of really small. Even the modes and even even the wireless LAN. I mean, uh, I think wireless LAN is even more so power like consumptive. That, yeah. That eta equals point oh one. So in fact, so, so I, I was going to say that, and I'm glad you said it. If you if you had to if you had to do this kind of cooperation, it might be better for a service provider now to consider putting a relay in a cellular network than to put a relay in an enterprise network. I mean, that is what I s oh, then to put, then to get, use laptops to cooperate in an enterprise network. Maybe putting a relay still gives you some benefits. But getting laptops to cooperate in an enterprise network 
given the amount of power they're going to consume for their own transmissions, it's it's not so. If you have a relay, you can still cooperate. If you have a, yes. I just said, yeah, user cooperation is less beneficial as the processing costs become very high. That's, that that's my point. So, curve like this is something you have all those pairs of places on this cone of the circle, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to I was going to come to that. This is this is averaged over all such points. So you choose a strategy, you choose a power allocation given whatever total is um, signaling whether it's and and then you evaluate the rates you obtain over all pair locations where the relay is fixed in that one spot. Yes. Yes, um, but note that this is also an average power. This power is not fixed. Only the transmit powers are fixed. The transmit powers are fixed. The processing power depends on the transmit power, and uh, so when you have p total, are you saying depending on the no, actually, no, 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 because it, I should, but I don't, um, because it makes it that much more complicated. Remember, my function f of r, which is my processing function, did not include, and it's just explicitly 1 plus pj for node j. It doesn't include any scaling by distance. Because then it's a much more complicated problem, so I stepped away from that. No too. Above, like, but you, do you optimize it over, like, well, in a specific geometry, maybe you want to help the one down? Yes. OK. So I should, have, I should have put that on my slide. When you do user cooperation, uh, I don't just randomly say, oh, user X is the, I, we are two users. I'm going to help him. He's going to help me. No. I only choose to cooperate with the other user. In other words, the other user forwards a packet for me only when my rate is better than what I can get directly to the destination. Yes. So in fact, you will see in the amplifying forward case that the TDMA rates are the same as the user cooperation. And that's only because uh, you might go, I actually, uh, that's the lower bound. OK, so next. Yes, yes. OK, so let's look at the two hop case. Uh, Let's look at the energy efficiency metric. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, Larry. When you take away the co-phasing advantage from the multiple, from the property users, don't the curves uh, suffer even? The curves are going to go further down, I mean, relative to TDMA. Yeah. So there's some, you get a bigger separation. With, 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 with relay versus user cooperation. That's yeah. correct. So yes. Relay yes. Also relay will go down, too. But I think my guess is user cooperation will go down even more than relay. Because again, even in the relay case now, you're getting a coherent combining gates. And you won't get that in the relay case either. Yeah. You only get the relay's power as a benefit. I mean, even in the source case, you get the source power as a benefit, but it's coming from their own transmissions. Yeah. Yeah. Why? 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 Yeah, yeah. But I would take it away. Yeah, but I would, yeah. OK, let's look at the energy efficiency. OK? Um, what I'm plotting here is actually, again, for every node location, set of node locations, I find the rate, I find the total power, I average the two. And I plot that as a function. So I'm keeping the x-axis the same for all of them. Instead of plotting it as total power, which will actually be on the rate, I keep it as a function of the transmit power, S and R. Okay? And what you see here is that when the processing factor is very, very small, uh, relay and to some extent user cooperation do much better than the energy efficiency curve for uh, time duplexing. Now, there are some very fundamental things here. When you actually divide rate by power, you, we all know that they do very well in the wide band regime, which is a very low power regime. That's why you see these curves are monotonically decreasing. right? But the other thing I want you to take away from these curves are that 
these, the relay and user cooperation do better up to a certain point. And then there's actually really a crossover power, and you'll see that further and further as eta increases, where beyond which it makes no sense, because as the power transfer power increases, the transmit rate increases, hence the processing cost increases. And if I have a larger factor multiplying my processing power, my, my doing cooperation is limited to a very low power regime. That's sort of. This is, are you talking about this, this line here? This is Gerhardt's suggestion that, oh, it's, yeah. So it says that, I should have said it. Now, you know, I should have mentioned that in my, yeah, I should have said that. Yeah, but it's not your fault. It's my fault that I didn't write it. Yeah. So I did want to mention, on the whole, of course, as total power increases, for the same rates, remember, the rates are the same. If you're scaling by different total powers, you're going to actually get lower and lower efficiencies. So energy efficiency falls. And the curves actually even change. The, so one overtakes the other eventually. And I'm saying that in this range, it is better for you to just do time duplexing. It's, there's no point to cooperating either by relay or user when your processing factors are so high for decode forward. You'll see a very different result with Amplify Forward. So I'm going to quickly go because there is a processing power for, for when you do your own encoding. There is always a processing power. Yes. Yes. So you can do the same for k equals 3. And I'm going to quickly show you those. Um, what, so there are now two curves for cooperation. They're always the blue curves. What is funny is that the 3 hop barely buys you anything relative to 2 hop. And there's a very easy answer for that. K is the number of users. Now it's 3. So I can do either a 2 hop if 2 users help me, or I can do a 3 hop if 2 users help me. But so, so one way to do that is to increase the dead zone. Yeah, I mean, there's various ways of analyzing that, but um, often, especially in cellular systems, you're interested in coverage, right? It's yeah. a very important uh, issue. It's just as a comment, it's not a criticism at all. It's, it's just um, this year, because you're averaging over everything, you may be pulling curves closer together. So if you mm. show benefits, then you may want to look at uh, different the problem with curves is that you can get quickly overwhelmed by the number you put yeah. there and distinguishing them. And, and a, okay. Um, okay, so the, the, the point I want you to take away from this is 3-hop is not buying you anything, and it's very easy to see why. I've shown you here a plot for three users over 100 locations. And think about it. The 3-hop is going to help these users sitting over here hopping via these users. Now, these users have a very high rate channel because their distances are very close to the destination. But instead of using it for their own time slot, they're going to take that power away from their own time slot and use it for these guys. In effect, actually, you don't really improve the rates, but you help these people, but you also lose some here. That's why you don't gain on the whole very much. So further to this point, even though you're not changing the overall scope, but it seems like you are helping with coverage. Yeah. <laughs> So, to, but to, to answer your question, you suggest you're just considering users on the rim, right? Say, or, but if I did that, most of those guys are not going to really cooperate with each other. They need these guys to bear the brunt of their transmissions, and I think that is fundamentally the problem with user cooperation. But, but they will be helped a lot by the relay. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. Of course. And then the people against relay will just say that you're giving a relay again. And then they might just come back and argue with it. Yeah. So averaging still shows that, right? So I mean, if I increase the scale factor, you see that the gains are even smaller. But, but what, what I want you to take away from this is that user cooperation really gives you no gains. And relay cooperation can give you up to 2 dB gains, which is or 1 dB gains, which is not, nothing to be sneezed at in the, in the, the highly theoretical model that we have here, right? I mean, this will all decrease in the real practical sense, but 
this is a this is a benchmark. Um, so let's look at the energy efficiency. And what you will see here is that in the two hop case, what you saw was that when the processing factor was one, TDMA started doing better than any of the cooperative schemes. You start seeing that even at the processing factor of half. And that's only because in the three, not, when the number of users increase, they are sharing their, in the user cooperative scheme, they're sharing their own limited resources between each other. In the relay scheme, there's only one relay with the same power as before, scaling in the same fashion. That's sharing it now between three users. So all you're saying is that if you had more people in the system, you have to scale your resources proportionately. Right? All right. Uh, jumping to amplify forward, you're going to see something very different. That's why I want to talk about this. Again, it's a similar. I'm going to plot some rate, energy efficiency. Let's consider the two-user case first, OK? I don't even consider a three-user case because you have a pre-log factor of half, 1 over k for k users. Forget any co coherent combining gains or any gains inside the log. The pre-log factor will kill you relative to TDME. And you'll see that right here in the two-hop case. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's true. That is true. But if I was a service provider, in reality, I can only pick one location for the relay. But a user can be everywhere in my sector, right? I can't. So that's an optimization problem. But what I notice, and I have it in detail in my thesis, is that contrary to the belief that the sources and relay should be clustered, it turns out the relay closer to the destination is actually better than the relay closer to the rim. Um, and it's very simple, path loss gains. That's all. Very, very simple. Um, and then there's an also another point. You may get capacity when you're clustered, but that capacity is not necessarily the largest rate you can get in a. This is what happens in multi terminal networks. Geometry matters. You can't say any absolutes without looking at geometry. You can't say if this gains capacity, this is probably a better rate than if you moved the network geometry and the distances and so on. So, anyway, coming back to amplify forward, the two hop. User cooperation gets very little negligible gains compared to TDMA. Relay cooperation gets you gains. But if you look at it in a realistic manner as a function of the total power, the relay cooperation gets you gains only in the very low power regime, low transmit power regime. And now I'm looking at a processing factor of 0.01 here. What happens, what is interesting is that that gains from the relay actually increases as the processing factor increases. And here's why. Maybe this is an artificial model for Amplify and Forward, but it's because in Amplify and Forward, there's really no processing cost that we have assumed for amplification. So dominantly, the costs are coming from transmission. When you have a relay, you have an additional transmit cost. So the relay becomes beneficial only when the processing cost of the users is so high that it's just easy to use a relay. It's a very small point. I think you see that better in the uh, energy efficiency plots. So in fact, relay cooperation does worse than uh, TDMA in the very low processing regime. And it does better in the high processing regime. And it's only because I have sort of neglected costs of amplification. And the, the relay is actually bearing down on me with this additional transmit power in the low processing regime. And so what, I, what, what it tells you is that if you had uh, a wireless LAN network, you might be better off just using Amplify Forward if you had a relay in the network. Because the costs of decode forward are much higher processing-wise. That's what you want to take away from here. OK, let's look at a, another metric, which is outage probability, to look at the diversity. And I'm going to focus on the maximum achievable diversity. In other words, I'm going to fix the rate of transmission and look at how well I can do. And uh, clearly, because I'm looking at maximum achievable diversity, I'm only going to consider, I'm not considering any partial decoding schemes. It's a, the, 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 the cooperating users are going to completely decode my message because I want an additional path of decoded message to the destination. Uh, specifically, I'm going to consider a dynamic decode and forward scheme where all these users are going to decode successfully. Until then, they're going to sit and listen. Okay? And uh, you can, again, consider a two-hop and a multi-hop scheme for the cooperative network, two-hop for the relay network. And, what the, the two ways I'm going to compare these networks and these schemes are both by the diversity, which is really the slope, asymptotically the slope of your outage curve, and the SNR gains, which means the translation of these curves with respect to each other. Okay? 
uh, I think we've gone over this. Now you know how decode forward is. There is no extra message. And what I want you to take away from the slide is what is what can you expect from the results? Now, if you had a K user network, cooperative network, and all K minus one users agreed to forward packets for any one user. You may think, oh, so k minus 1 users are helping me. I have a total of k paths to the destination. I should actually get a, a diversity of k. But in the two hop case, when all the users transmit together, you don't actually get that unless the users are clustered. And there's a very simple reason for that. Think about it. If all the users are going to transmit, you're actually going to wait for the worst user to decode your message. He is going to uh, determine the length of this fraction before you start transmitting. So that worst user is sort of bearing down the whole system. It's, it's, the entire performance is dependent on that worst user. So you really don't get better than two unless you are all clustered together and then you have similar behavior and you all start transmitting very quickly. So what this is telling you is that very often user cooperation is touted as getting these K users K uh, diversity, K fold diversity gains. It's not really true if you use uh, the channel many K, K times, as you will see in the next slide. So if you do the multi hop case, then yes, you've used the channel K times. You're allowing each user to come on only when they're ready to uh, transmit, and then you can get a diversity of K. But just from the complexity of this uh, coding scheme, you see that you have a delay associated with this. There's an associated complexity, and you'll also see there's a processing cost associated with it. Now, with Amplify and Forward, in the two-hop case, irrespective of the number of users, you only get a diversity gain of two. And that's very simple, because every other guy is like an antenna who's forwarding exactly your signal. It's a noisy version, but it's the same signal. When it's the same signal, you cannot get more than diversity two. Okay? And the relay will, of course, in all these networks, the relay only gives you diversity too because it's a single antenna relay sitting there. But you will see that the diversity doesn't matter. The translation of the curves will matter. And the multi-hop case, which is only for the user cooperative network, Amplify and Forward can give you a diversity K. OK, so let's jump into the plots. Uh, first, I'm going to give you the uh, dynamic decode forward plots for two users and then three users. This is, again, um, an outage curve as a function of uh, transmit SNR. Let's look at total power, because that's a more realistic and fair comparison. TDMA, you sort of you start seeing that the slope is going to converge to 1. Okay, um, The outage curves for cooperative, the slope starts converging to 2. And the relay, too, is again 2. You're averaging the outage probability over for any two users at two locations, you average the outage of this user and this user. So it's average outage and then over the entire geometry. So it's really like 200 for two users. Yes. Yes. So in fact, you consistently see that Relay has a better performance in terms of SNR gains for the same diversity. So, so the notion is for the cooperative, it's always symmetric, right? If I, uh, you know, at some time, if I uh, forward from you, you forward from me, right? I don't assume that. In, in this case, yeah, in the outage case, I assume everybody actually forwards for everybody else because I'm interested in diversity. But in the weight case, I did not assume that. Because you could sit, you could be further away from me. I'm not going to get much. Saying, you're assuming that here, right? Yes, I do assume that in the uh, diversity case because I'm, in this, uh, I'm interested in the multi paths. I'm not so much interested. Yes, so that, that bears as a cost. This is one reason why these curves are translated to the right of uh, the relay curve, because somebody further away from you is using their power to transmit for you. You're right. But if I didn't do that, on average, my slope might be even worse than this. My slope will be even closer to the, if, if, if not every user helped every other user, then I'm not going to get diversity to, for every user. But how does it matter if the slope is worse? It sort of trips the curve down a little bit. Yeah, but, well, yeah, so it might shift the curve like this. Oh, it does matter how the slope is, right? I mean, that also determines how your outage goes down. So you're right. So I might get a curve that looks like this. OK, that's a valid point. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I don't know how. So you, you're right. You'll see that in some, some other case. So maybe Obviously, there's a point. Hardly ever see or maybe never any outage curves with the with the, with the what? Any 
not a church. They, 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 they rarely exist. You know, they don't normally they don't see, see them process unless Garrett is like even there. Uh, and sometimes uncoded is better. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's sure. It's funny. Yes, it's always fixed. That's the geometry that doesn't change. Um, so again, as the processing factor increases, you actually see that all these curves get translated because of the power. So uh, there comes a rate, there comes a power region beyond which it's actually better to do cooperation here, right? Um, likewise for the three hop case. So now the point, case in point is three hop. If you use three hops, this is the star curve, the blue one. You do start seeing a slope of three. But as Narayan pointed out, so I have, it doesn't matter if it has slope three. In terms of outage performance, it's very comparable to the relay of slope two. So you're not getting any SNR gains or any translation gains from the three outage. That's just because of the power range that you're looking at. Right? Um, so I'm sort of running through this a little bit. And, and another thing I want you to keep in mind is that as the processing factor increases, these curves are all translated to the right. So the, 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 the range is where they become useful actually sort of reduces, right? Here's why. The probability of outage is independent of my processing cost. But my processing cost determines my x-axis. So for the same outage, my processing cost keeps increasing when my power processing factor increases. So all these curves are just shifted to the right. The only curve you know, the cooperation doing does much better. Yes. Yes. No, 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 oh, no, no, no. I, I, I was just answering that with Predrag. It in this model, I don't assume that only some users will help the others. I allow every user to be helped by all the other users. Suppose I had three users, some arbitrary location. Every user is going to is is will have his signal overheard by the other users and forwarded to the destination. In other words, I'm ensuring that there are multiple paths. For the relay, there's only, there's only two paths. Yes, and it's only because this is averaged over many, many more locations. And the relay is sort of fixed in this 0.5. And the users can be even closer. And then there's this guy sitting way back. He's helping you. He's forwarding a signal, but he's expending his power doing it. So. Yes, but that is only because yeah, so, so there, there's a pro and a con to this, right? When many users help you, you get diversity gains. That is seen by the, cur the slope. But it comes at a power cost. I think I'm saying the same thing many, many times. It's dominated by, I mean, it, without the relay, it's going to be dominated by the slope. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, OK, I understood what he meant. All right. I'm guessing that's yeah. the, 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 the OK, I got it. All right. I'm guessing. No, you're right, actually, because the ra it can vary in range. So remember, I showed you some specific geometries, and then we saw there were even smaller numbers than these. This is what you're offering. So you're interested in this kind of issue, too, coverage. Yeah. That's pretty significant. Yeah, so I guess the, the story is the users are the further in at the rim of the No, but, but, but these are dominated by distance because the model specifically accounts for distance, right? So, yeah. You are making people compulsory go through the relay even if they are closer to the destination? Like, yes, in the relay network and in the user cooperative network go through each other even if they are closer to the destination. That's correct. So, yeah, that is why you see that strange behavior. So, yeah, maybe, maybe one has to think more about how to plot these curves, right? Um, I have to do a similar optimization like I did for the no fading case. Finally, for the amplifying forward, actually, what happens is, uh, so if, if you consider a two hop case, it's two users. Consistently, the relay network gives you way better uh, coding gains, or SNR gains, as we call them, than the, uh, than the cooperative network. And I guess you're right. It's probably coming from the users being further away. Yeah. 
It is simple. Well, even in the other case, this is only two hop. It is simple, right? All of those guys are forwarding for you. But the thing is, imagine having noisy signals for many of them. It doesn't add to much. That's what it is. Um, so the funny thing is, if you looked at one, one or two specific geometries, you, can, you get very quirky behavior. And then when you average, you sort of get a completely different behavior. You cannot correlate. Um, so if you look at the three hop, of course the three hop gives you uh, a diversity gains, uh, threefold diversity gains. But there is a cost to it, and there is really not much SNR gains that you get out of it. And uh, that's, a, that's more or less uh, the behavior you see again and again. So I'm going to jump to the summary. What I want you to take away from this part is really that uh, if you use two, two kinds of metrics, say you use the achievable rates, then um, it tells you if you use any scheme where you decode, you're better off using that scheme in the low processing regime. Amplify and forward, interestingly, uh, seems to do better in the high processing regime. And it's only because then you can overcome the power cost of uh, using a relay. And that's only for the relay network. Really, overall, you do find that on, on average, the relay, relaying is actually uh, more desirable than user cooperation. And likewise, an outage, uh, at first thought, you would think that, uh, well, if I use multiple users to help me, you can get a k-fold diversity gain. But the k-fold diversity gain comes with its cost. It, besides these processing costs and delay and complexity, it doesn't really buy you much in terms of SNR gains. And I think that matters when you compare the two curves in translation. So, and, and, and the real reason for that is simply that the users in the relay network are being very happy and selfish using their resources just for themselves. And, uh, that about concludes my talk. I'm just going to very briefly review uh, a lot of other work that I've done um, on the mark, which is in the, some of it is in the thesis. And that includes a little bit that I described the offset encoding for decode forward. And uh, it also, I also have a result on the sum capacity for a degraded Gaussian relay channel. It's sort of interesting from a theoretical point of view because capacity results are very few in number for multi-terminal networks. And this was not a very obvious uh, well, it, it is obvious in the sense that it's a degraded channel. The relay has a better signal than the destination. So you would think decode forward should achieve capacity. But it, it isn't as simple as a single user case. And we needed to do, I needed to do some maximum optimization, use some optimization techniques to prove this result. Uh, it was recently presented at the ITA workshop. Um, and finally, I also have a result with one of my um, committee members. And this was on, um, so it's a very, a cute result. Uh, if you consider a uh, half duplex multi-axis relay channel, and you say the relay is going to use orthogonal dimensions to listen and transmit, and you start maximizing the decode forward sum rate, you find that, uh, first of all, this problem has a huge element of geometry. It sort of tells you your allocation schemes depend on geometry. But the question we are asking here is, if the users knew their fading gains, how would they use the channel? And it turns out you want to opportunistically schedule these users so that the user with the best channel transmits. Now, in a multi-axis channel, that's simply the user with the best channel to the destination. But in a multi-axis channel with a relay, the question is the best channel to what? And so it could be the best channel to the relay or to the destination. And that really depends on the geometry of the network. But the overarching uh, answer is that opportunistic communication sort of still holds in this, in this problem. So you're not going to typically schedule both users. You're going to give the user the back. It's a greedy solution, in other words. So that, that's the result we're going to present at ISIT. And I've also worked with another graduate student here at WinLab. Um, it was his master's thesis. And we used a, sort of a different motivation to understand when cooperation is, um, is beneficial in networks. Or if you had a set of uh, rational users who are out to take care of themselves, would they just share their resources with each other happily? And it turns out they'll only do that when there are incentives. Um, and we s developed that using the framework of coalition game theory. And I'm done. And I just want to quickly present my best result here. And that is my uh, <laughs> child. And, uh, and uh, thank you. And I know Narayan already thanked. But I want to say a quick word of thanks to, of course, Narayan first for just actually taking me, I walked into his uh, office like five years back, and I said, Narayan, I want to work with you. And he said, yeah, sure. 
You know what? You know what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> well. <laughs> but we are where we are now, and uh, I guess something similar happened when I went to Gerhard's office and said, I want to work with you, Gerhard, and he was like, okay. And um, I have really benefited from working with, well, with Narayan and with Gerhard. I mean, just an incredible experience, very inspiring. So I have to thank you for it. Um, and uh, I want to thank Roy, and I want to really thank Roy for attending all my talks, giving me so much advice, always making sure I gave good talks, and just reading my proposals. Thank you. And my committee members, uh, Pridrag, I've, I've talked, I've, Pridrag has also attended my talks many times, given me feedback. I think these things are so useful, valuable. And Vince for um, agreeing to mentor me and uh, you know, supporting me in my application and stuff. And thank you for being on my committee. And, and Larry, a very good friend, and many professors at WinLab, and uh, other professors, the students, and everybody who's here today, and my family, my husband. Thank you. I'm done.